Hello, and welcome to the Folklore and Fiction Podcast. My name is Kelly McCath Morin. I'm a PhD candidate in the Folklore Department at Memorial University of Newfoundland, and I'm also a speculative fiction writer under the pseudonym C.S. McCath. The Folklore and Fiction Podcast and Dispatch synthesize these passions with a focus on folklore scholarship aimed at storytellers. You'll find the Folklore and Fiction archive along with the rest of my work online at folkloreandfiction.com. Interested listeners will find a link to the current dispatch in the show notes, where a more comprehensive record of this episode can be found, including a bibliography and other references. This episode of the Folklore and Fiction podcast was first published as a newsletter in September 2019. I'm recording it as a supplemental podcast now so that new listeners and subscribers have an opportunity to engage with the material. In it, I'm discussing the fable genre, with help from scholars Patrick Olivelle, Christos A. Zafiropoulos, Harriet Spiegel, and others, helping you analyze a fable and discussing ways to bring fables to your storycraft. Fables are a ubiquitous story form, found throughout the history of story transmission and in the folkloric traditions of people all over the world. Perhaps the oldest and most widespread of these are the Panchatantra and the collection of tales attributed to Aesop, who might or might not have been a real person. These two pillars of the fable genre will be the focus of my attention here, along with a brief foray into Harriet Spiegel's translation of Marie de France's Fables for contrast. Folkloric Definition of the Fable Zephyropoulos offers an excellent definition of the Greek fable in his work on the Collectio Augustana, which is the oldest complete collection of Greek fables we have. He writes that, quote, The Greek fable is a brief and simple fictitious story with a constant structure, generally with animal protagonists, but also humans, gods, and inanimate objects, e.g. trees, which gives an exemplary and popular message on practical ethics and which comments, usually in a cautionary way, on the course of action to be followed or avoided in a particular situation. End quote. This gives us a great deal to work with, but it also needs unpacking. Fable structure. Let's start with structure. Aesop's fables are prose narratives comprised of four parts. The information, a moment of choice, a final action, and a moral. In them, the protagonist is situated in place and time. She makes a choice between courses of action, the outcome of her choice is indicated, and a moral written beneath the tale called an epimetheum makes the point of the narrative clear. The Panchatantra contains five books of emboxed prose and poetic narratives in which a tale is situated within another tale, which is itself situated in a third tale, and so on. Outer tales frame inner tales and introduce them by way of a proverb, a brief allusion, or a poetic verse. The structure here is more complex and rooted in ancient Indian scripture, but these are still morality tales containing characters who find themselves in unusual situations, make choices for good or ill, and face the consequences of their actions. Malia de France's poetic fables follow Aesopic structure more closely, and indeed, many of them are Greek fables retold. However, there is no epimetheum set off from the rest of her narratives. It's embedded at the end of each poem. Fable characters. For the most part, fable characters are animals. So while they might also be humans, gods, or trees, my focus here is on animals and their importance to the genre. Zaphiropoulos writes that animals were often used in ancient Greek thought as a means of discussing human morality. And Olivelle tells us that in the Panchatantra, Animal society mirrors human principles of government and political science. Jill Mann offers a sensible reason for this when she writes that the presence of animal protagonists removes any expectation of psychological complexity on the part of the listener or reader, so that the behavior of the animal is seen as inevitable or natural. I would add to this an observation about the appearance of aliens in science fiction literature and television, who often exhibit human characteristics, offering readers and viewers an opportunity to see both themselves and the other through the lens of a non-human being's person and choices. This episode of the Folklore and Fiction podcast is a preview, and you can listen to the full episode on the Folklore and Fiction website. 
Just click on the dispatch link in the show notes or go to folkloreandfiction.com and sign up for a free account. Thanks very much for your interest. Copyright 2019 to 2023. Kelly S. McCath Morin. All rights reserved unless Creative Commons licensing is specifically applied.